he's um oh thank you <laughs> he's the chairperson of the friends of socotra association in, in addition to being members of other societies he's also a co-author of over 80 academic publications which is marvelous and we're looking forward to his talk tonight. Um, the Natural History Group actually had a visit to Socotra in, two, in 2010 and everybody who went thoroughly enjoyed it. Now to get to the title of his talk. The talk title is Biodiversity, Richness and Conservation Challenges in the Socotra Archipelago, Yemen, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we're looking forward to hearing his lecture. Um, but just before I stop, um, just to say that um, the Socotra, Friends of Socotra are having, um, are having um, an annual general meeting in September this month between the 24th and 26th of September. So now we look forward to listening to your talk, Dr. Kay. Thank you. I hand, you over, hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Valerie, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for your interest in, in uh, Socotra and in, in this talk. Um, I'm happy to see some faces that I've seen a long time ago and some faces that I've seen very recently on Socotra. So um, there is at least one Socotran here at, in the meeting, which is uh, very nice as well. So special welcome to you, uh, Ahmed. Um, I will talk to you for the next 40 minutes. I hope I have a long presentation. So for the next 40 minutes, I will talk about uh, the Socotra archipelago, I hope. It will not um, bore you in any way because I will start with a very ancient history of the place. Um, and I'm waiting for my slides to, yes. Can you see my slide changing? Yes. Thank you. So um, this is a, just a quick view um, of Socotra's Detwa Lagoon, which is Yemen's only Ramsar uh, site on Socotra Island. And I will start with the background going quite far in time. Um, so Socotra used to be part of the mainland. It used to be part of the Arabian uh, Peninsula close to, uh, it was connected to Oman, close to Mirbat and to Salala. Um, and at that time, so this is before the Gulf, the opening of the Gulf of Aden in the, in, which started in the Oligocene, Miocene, um, Socotra was connected, but also the Horn of Africa was still connected to uh, Southern Arabia. Then uh, gradually, around 30 million years ago, this started to, these two uh, partly con uh, continents start to split. And Socotra moved with opening up the Gulf of Aden, moved south together with actually the Horn of Africa as a small granite platform that was very hard and tough. So it broke off and it, and it went south southwards. So Socotra is a continental island with a continental origin. And this is as opposed to the Galapagos, for example, which is a volcanic island that emerged in the sea. Socotra did not. This is important for its biodiversity because whatever was present on Arabia at that time before the split of African Arabia, some, some of these lineages actually survived in Socotra and were able to continue and created this amazing place. Um, it is also important to say that the event that created the, the opening of the Gulf of Aden is the same event that created the current climate where Arabia became more arid and the Indian mon monsoon uh, originated. So the climate that we have today actually started from that period. But before that, Arabia was quite um, tropical in, uh, in, and quite green. So this was also important to know because Socotra, which is moved more into a tropical zone uh, with, with kind of wet uh, visits of, uh, of monsoons, was able to save some of that climate, but also save some of that nature. On the right, you also see the fact that part of these areas were inundated uh, in these times, so underwater in the blue. Um, and this means part of Arabia was also underwater at that time, but Socotra apparently, as some geologists say, was part of it were high enough to keep some, some um, groups of animals and plants alive. On the left below, you see um, Greater Socotra, which is a, the granite platform, which is under the sea. And at, uh, during the ice ages, 
um, when there was sea level low stats, this entire platform would have been above water as well, which means there was possibility for exchange of fauna and flora. So currently, Socotra Archipelago consists of four islands um, and two small islets, the small black dots. Um, the population of Socotra is estimated at about 100,000 people. This is the most recent uh, estimate. While some have Darsa, have Darsa is uninhabited by people. Some has a few people and Adokuri also a few hundreds. Adokuri is actually quite close to Somalia, as you can see. And its flora is quite different from that of Socotra. Um, I put at the end of each slide, I put the, um, the reference for these images so that you can each, each time, if you wish to uh, look up the, uh, the background about this, uh, this information. So Socotra is actually, as it is a very old uh, piece of land, what you see below in the pink is granite. This is the oldest part of, uh, of the island, which is cropping up. Uh, and, and becomes quite high, up to 1,500 meters in the Hagar Mountains. Around that, you have the, uh, below in the geological map in 3D, you have the uh, orangey brown zones, which are uh, Paleocene, Eocene, limestone. And then you have the lowlands, which has more quaternary uh, inputs for those who are, have an interest in geology. But this is a view of Socotra from the south. So you see the Southern Plain, the Nogat Plain, you see the five fingers, as they say in Socotra, going up, which are the wadis connected to the mountains. You see on the left, a central plain, which is the Zag plain. And you see the large plateaus, which is uh, from, from uh, west to east, which is um, Kataria. And then you have uh, Shibohan, Dexam. And then on the, on, the, uh, on the other side, there's the Momi plateau. So this is a very quick. And on the, on the, on the complete west side, you have the Male Plateau, and then just after that, or actually above that, there is the Kalansia Valley. These are four major um, types of geology that you can spot on Socotra. So you have the Palazoic Granite, which is the oldest type, which is either gray or pink, um, mostly if you see it, and the pink is actually uh, also an endemic, endemic uh, stone on Socotra. It's called Ribekit. It's only, only found on Socotra. Then the majority, almost 70% of the surface is Mesozoic uh, or early Cenozoic limestone. So this is the Paleocene, Eocene um, limestone, which is very karstic. So you can see it, it's, for those who have been in Madagascar, very similar to the Singhi forest uh, limestone in some areas. Other areas is just blocks of limestone uh, and flat. And of course, many, many caves, which is typical in large limestone formations. Uh, below left, you see quaternary uh, deposits such as elevated fossil corals. And um, below right, you see quaternary dunes. Uh, as you know, for those that have been in Socotra, you can see these very large dunes, both in the south uh, and in the north, which are uh, very impressive. So these are more recent deposits. The geodi geodiversity translates itself into a biodiversity. So there is a large diversity of geology and geological features, and this is translated into a diversity of fauna and flora. It allows this fauna and flora to be adapted to different types of soils and different types of, with also the elevation, different types of uh, climate within the, within the islands. So most of the, my talk will be about Socotra Island itself, because although I've been in Samha Darsa and Abdul Kuri, uh, I will focus on Socotra. So here you see some very typical uh, views on Socotra, but mainly this is from the highlands. So you see uh, dragon trees in, in home hill valleys. You see Wadi Zirik in, in, uh, in Dexam. Uh, below left, you see a part of, uh, of Momi, and below right, this is just above Haihaft, where you see the, the dragon blood tree and some aloe. The climate system of Socotra, for those who wish to visit, they know that some periods of the year it's un it's not uh, pleasant to visit because the winds are too strong. And so Socotra is, um, has se several uh, weather systems of which the largest are the, uh, the um, Northeast monsoon and the Southwest monsoon. Both come from a different direction and uh, the winds can be quite strong. And in between 
There are transition periods where the Socotri have different names for it. They have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different names for the different seasons and their tradition, uh, transitions. So these transitions are important because some of these seasons, for example, Kayat, February to April, mainly towards April, are important for pollination of dates, for example, which is spe very special atmosphere and weather. Now, um, we've come from the geological history and now rapidly into the human history. Um, and this is a, a text from about uh, if, um, first century um, before Common Era where Socotra was called Dioscorida, which was a Greek name. And this is a Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. It's an anonymous uh, writer who writes about different areas and he writes also about Socotra. So he wrote, he wrote about the people, but he also writes about crocodiles and huge lizards and different types of uh, tortoise, so land, uh, um, land turtles, which now are no longer found there. Whether this is accurate or whether he confused certain areas is not clear. What is a fact is that every single Indian Ocean has had a land tortoise, but on Socotra they have never been found. So it is also likely and possible that they were there. Um, research on the island, archaeological research, uh, for example, in the caves, have shown that the island was quite important in the first centuries um, uh, after Christ. And there are quite a lot of, it's quite a rich, it has quite a rich history. It was um, visited by people from all over the Indian Ocean, in particular from uh, Western Asia, but all the way to India, people have visited, uh, in these first centuries, visited Socotra and their very ancient writings and pottery that, um, and a tablet that have been found in Hokke. I show this very rapidly because I was part of all of these expeditions when they were taking place and they were quite, um, not all, but, the first ones, and I was quite, uh, it was quite uh, interesting. Um, I will skip over the history between uh, around uh, from the 14th century until now, but it's quite a rich history. If you want to read more up about this, you can find it back in our book, uh, the book about the natural history of Socotra and its islands, which is which I edited and which was uh, authored by uh, Catherine Chung and Lyndon Devonshire. But if you are on the island and you are close to Hadibo, you go to Souk, uh, which is a village just, uh, just east from Hadibo. On the top of there, there is a small mountain called Hawari Mountain. And there you have an old fortress, uh, which you can see, which was actually uh, a fortress by the Mahara Sultanate. And it's looking down on, on, this, um, on the, uh, this estuary, which was the old harbor of Socotra, because before, um, before Hadibo was the capital, actually Souk was the capital. So you can imagine in this area is where the Portuguese boats at some point came, but they didn't stay for very long because uh, they, didn't, they didn't like Socotra too much. What you know Socotra for um, is its plants very often. So Socotra is very famous since antiquity for very famous and very interesting plants. In fact, at some point in history, uh, Socotra must have been one of the um, lead players in the global alloy market. And so uh, in some old uh, pharmacies, even in Belgium, I've seen old uh, pharmacy um, uh, furniture saying Socotrin. And Socotrin had become in the 18th century and the 19th century became a synonym, a synonym of alloy products because Socotra at some point was uh, really trading uh, huge amounts of aloe to the world and it was very famous. To this day, aloe is still being used on Socotra and as we all know, aloe has magic properties for which it's still being used on the island itself. Mostly this is uh, de derived from aloe peri, uh, which is on the right. And there's a second and a third species, but aloe peri is the most common one um, where uh, aloe is being extracted from. The leaves are not so thick, so it's not like the uh, aloe ferox from South, uh, South Africa, for example, where there are very thick leaves um, that people are using. So there's not so much yield for commercial extraction, but for local uh, use, it's very important for wound healing, for stomach, for all of these things. 
Another very important or two very important species that you see on the, on the, on the right of the image is the dragon's blood tree. Um, so it's also an endemic species only found in Socotra. And then the frankincense tree, which produces the luban uh, or the frankincense. These resins, together with several comifora resins, have been very important also since antiquity for Socotra. And there's an, an enormously interesting and very good book about the ethnobotan ethnobotanical knowledge of Socotra, which is the ethnoflora by Anthony Miller and Miranda Morris. All the uses of all the plants in Socotra are recorded in that. Um, also, again, to this day, uh, Socotra dragon's blood is used on Socotra, and it's actually only dragon's blood tree of which this traditional use uh, is still there. There are, as you know, also dragon blood trees, other species in Oman, Canary Islands, in Africa and other places. But Socotran people are the only ones that still actively use the, the red resin, the dragon's blood uh, as a medicine and for other purposes. So since antiquity, the Socotri have been um, living more or less in harmony with their island because they depend on the resources because the space is limited and the resources are also limited. This is very different from a continental uh, setting where resources might be, might be uh, not as limited. And on top of that, Socotra was cut off in the past, but also still now for a certain part of the year. So people had to really rely on their environment. As a result, the Socotra have developed very strong, very useful traditional rules for both land and sea. On the top, you see a man, uh, you see a group of people um, with, a, with a tree. Um, and traditionally, and it's still in some areas in Socotra, before there's even one tree being cut for the use in the village or for anything, there is a meeting about this and there are very specific rules. The same for fishing in, in some, some areas, some seasons and some size of fish, all of these have very strong traditions. However, Socotra is changing, of course. So with the changing of these rules or the disappearance of these rules, Socotra is also under threat. Now, I promised you to talk about biodiversity and this is definitely something uh, that I believe uh, a group of natural history is uh, interested in. So I will focus a little bit first on the diversity and then on the challenge. Here you see the Socotra chameleon, which is also an endemic species, one of the 31 um, reptiles on the land of Socotra archipelago. For plants, there is a huge diversity with, uh, let's say about 850 species of which 37% are endemic, which is very high and comparable, for example, to the Galapagos. And in, in comparison to other islands in the world, this is, this is also quite, quite impressive. If you compare to many areas and continents in the world or countries, this is really high. Belgium, for example, we have perhaps perhaps one endemic uh, small grass or moss or something, but it's nothing in comparison to the uniqueness of these species in Socotra. And on top of that, they are not only unique they all, as a species, but they also hold very unique properties and pro products which are uh, can can be very um, useful for medicine, for example. So this is the um, Socotra dragon's blood tree forest. Uh, it's the only remaining dragon tree forest on the planet. There is no other ecosystem like this uh, still uh, surviving in the world. Only Socotra has it. Um, and this is an image that you often see um, and that you might imagine Socotra looks like if you haven't been there. However, this is in a very, very small area, and Socotra is, most of it is actually quite arid, uh, not, not like this. So this is a very unique and very important and very vulnerable ecosystem. It is also, this is the only area in Firmihin where there are also relatively young dragon blood trees that are still uh, able to regenerate. Um, Um, so the, um, the dragon blood tree forest was um, common in, even in Europe 
in tertiary times and it has disappeared. So Socotra is actually one of the few places still existing. This is a very quick view of uh, a wide biodiversity um, on the island. All of these pictures, all of these animals that you see here are endemic, except for the, uh, the one on the bottom right in the corner. It's perhaps an endemic. I haven't um, still working on that one. But all the others, they are endemic species. So you can see the Socotran freshwater crab, which is very unusual because its closest relative is not in Africa or Arabia, but is in Asia, in, in Eastern Asia. You have a jumping spider, then you have a, a very beautiful Socotra bluet or Grant's bluet, which is the only endemic dragonfly. You have an endemic scorpion, the endemic Socotran buzzard, the bunting, the sunbird, chameleon the beautiful Socotra emperor, um, butterfly, one of the snakes, and then in the middle, one of these amazing uh, Socotran uh, mosques. Um, originally, when I went to Socotra in 1999, um, I was part of a large expedition, uh, which was organized under the UNDP uh, project, which was, Ahm Ahmed was also there in this expedition. We were part of this big group doing for the first time in centuries, a large um, biodiversity survey. And I was still very young at that time in my twenties. And Socotra was extremely impressive to me um, as, a, as a young uh, biologist. In the subsequent years, I um, focused myself for several years on the caves. And together with Peter de Guise, who's on the top of this image, I'm in the red circle, we uh, explored very uh, intensively explored uh, Socotran caves, and Peter was leading these expeditions together with uh, a number of Belgian cavers. Whereas the surface of Socotra is full of special animals and plants, the caves are also full of special animals and plants. And on the left, on the top, you can see some of them, which I've been um, discovering and recently also describing. So these are together with specialists from those groups. Um, these caves are extremely important, but also extremely fragile. This is one of these uh, cave whip spiders from the Amlipigi group, uh, from the, um, a very uh, small group of arachnids. And we found some new species, uh, among which this is the last one we described in 2004, but there are still more uh, to be described. And this species, I just uh, we just described this year. It's a very small crustacean, uh, which from a species group that is found in Arabia and Northern Africa, well, North, uh, Northeast Africa, and then uh, now in Socotra. And so it's also an endemic species found very deep uh, into one of the largest caves. Well, actually the largest cave in Socotra and the largest cave in the Middle East. As you can see, the UAE is still empty for this group, but actually I'm very sure that these uh, Thermos bainids, these blind, small freshwater uh, crustaceans are also found there. It's, there's no doubt that they can also be found there. It's just um, a matter of looking for them in the right deposits. And then I, I have, I'm not a marine biologist, so I didn't focus on the marine life and the marine, uh, and I, I have never uh, dived, doven, diven, dived on Socotra. Um, but the marine life is also uh, very rich and very unusual, and it has a mixture. Um, on, on the northern side of Socotra has a mixture of the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea faunas and floras, and on the south side, even things from further in the uh, Indian Ocean, even from the Pacific. So there are, Socotra has an extremely rich um, marine biodiversity, and again, also very sensitive because of potential overfishing. I, I put a manta ray here, this picture is not mine, because manta rays are beautiful, and because you can see enormous schools of manta rays between Socotra and Darsa, near to Darsa. So just as a small recap for the terrestrial life, um, there are many plants on Socotra, many species, 850 of which about, so about 850, so I think it's, about, it's 840 and something, uh, about, of which about 37% endemic. Insects, the most recent count stood at about uh, 1,670 species, of, of, of which 40% spe uh, endemic, which is a lot. Mollusks, almost everything except for two. 
I'm talking only about terrestrial mollusks here, not uh, freshwater mollusks, which are mainly uh, invasive. And it goes on. I just want to point out also reptiles. There's 90% endemism. And for birds, I put the number of breeding birds, but there are 250 birds that have been um, spotted on Socotra, of which about 50 are breeding. And of, of these 50, uh, 11, 10 to 11 are endemic, so that's about 20% of the breeding species. And mammals, there are about 14 mammals, but only, only uh, two, two are endemics. Yes, which are the bats. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Yes. As I am a freshwater biologist, an aquatic biologist, I want to jump for a little on the freshwater. So this is what the I have, which has very strong diversity. And on the top right, you see the Socotra freshwater crab, which is a very nice endemic uh, species and genus. And there's another endemic genus of freshwater crabs on Socotra, which lives mainly on the land. Below that is a beautiful triops. This is very close to the group I study. I'm actually a specialist of water fleas. And this group, this triops or um, tadpole shrimp, as they're called in English, they're also found in, in, uh, in Arabian in temporary pools. And when the pool, um, just after rains, when the pool fills, these animals um, appear within a week and then they, they are very good for killing mosquitoes. And then below there is the uh, endemic uh, um, Socotra bluet, which is a beautiful damselfly and the only endemic dams damselfly on the island. I recently did a study, uh, Ahmed was part of the publication about the, uh, about the dragonflies of Socotra and we looked at the distribution of these, um, of these dragonflies and this is the distribution of the one endemic species. Um, and in very light blue, you see the distribution points of records before 1960. So I went in all the literature and looked at all the, all the uh, descriptions and all the uh, records of that time. And then in normal blue, there is uh, between 1960 and 2000, and then the purple ones are beyond 2000. But what you can see is that in the Hadibo plain, where the two blue dots are on the, the more uh, Western blue dots are on the top, the light blue, they are no longer found there anymore. So it means that the area, because this is the Hadibo area, has also been changing. It's one of the first studies that actually look at change of, uh, of biodiversity over time. Um, right, I will jump into protection. Oh, my apologies for the telephone sound. So uh, Socotra has some national and international designations. The, um, the first national designation, actually uh, the largest one is the Socotra Conservation Zoning Plan, which is a law. Uh, it's a Yemeni law by presidential decree of 2000. And it defines the zones and the level of protection for, the, uh, for different uh, protected areas. In 2003, Socotra became a UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve. Και γι' αυτό σου λέω είναι ότι εσύ δεν είδε και θα έχει πιο ολοκληρωμένη άποψη αν έβλεπε με ζούζε σε αυτό το σπίτι στο εξάμεινο. Σε αυτό το εξάμεινο. I hear Greek. I hear someone speaking in Greek. Can somebody mute? Oh, thank you. Sorry. So in 2003, Socotra became UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve. This is called the Socotra Archipelago Biosphere Reserve. In 2007, the first Socotra, uh, the first Ramsar site, and the, until now, the only Ramsar site in Yemen was designated in Socotra, Detwa Lagoon. And in 2008, Socotra became UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, by criterion 10, so only a natural site. In 2017, it also became part of uh, this um, special marine um, um, status under the Convention of Biological Diversity. Plus, as you know, Yemen has ratified Convention of Biological Diversity and therefore also um, um, sticks to CITES, Nagoya Protocol, and other international ratifications. So Socotra has both national and international uh, conservation protection. In fact, there are very few places in the entire world, 
less than 100, which have UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve, Ramsar site, and UNESCO World Heritage Site at the same time. This is the general uh, view of the both the um, zoning plan and the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve and UNESCO World Heritage Site. I did not uh, put here in detail the um, the nature sanctuaries like Home Hill and Skant, but this is showing in green the core area as defined in UNESCO uh, for UNESCO, but which is also corresponding to the national park area. So as you can see, Socotra is 70% of the land is national park, which has very high protection status. The yellow, as you can see, is terrestrial and marine buffer zones, which also has high protection status, and which is meant to protect the core areas. Um, and then in, in gray are the only development areas or transition zones, which is the Haulaf area, Hadibo area, and Kalansi area, and also Muri, Muri Air, Airport. So, um, now we move to the challenges. And here, I don't know if you can see this slide and if you recognize this lady, um, I just want to quickly say something about this, um, the beauty barrier. So when we see Socotra, we see very amazing and unusual beauty. We see trees that we've never seen before. We see white beaches and we see am amazing things. And it was the same when I went first to Socotra 20 years ago, but after 20 years and going back nearly every year, and sometimes two times per year, my view has also, I've also seen the changes and people on Socotra also see the changes as they, as they talk about. So the Marilyn Monroe effect is something I just invented. Uh, I, I just want to say during this talk, it, it comes from a poem that I saw in one of, in a movie where, where um, a professor says to another professor that beautiful women are invisible because there is the beauty barrier. You see what's on the outside, but you never look past the outside. And I'm using Marilyn Monroe as, a, as, a, as an example because she was a, a symbol of beauty. She was a, a very good looking woman, but she was suffering from, from very strong uh, psychological problems and she was, which eventually, uh, led to her uh, demise. Socotra looks very beautiful, but in fact, it is really, really under threat. And it's on the outside, it looks very nice. But if you look closer, many things are, are, are not going in the right direction. And if it keeps going in this way, in 100, 200, 300 years, you will not see one dragon blood tree standing there anymore, not one frankincense tree standing there anymore. And there will be, for example, extinction of certain reptiles and birds. As you may know, more than 80% of all extinctions of reptiles and birds on our planet have happened on islands, not on continents. So islands are much more vulnerable to any change, any small change than anything on the continent. I'm saying this because as Socotra's UNESCO World Heritage Site, the definition of a World Heritage Site is that it becomes the responsibility of every single citizen in the world. So Socotra is, is, is each and everyone's responsibility and its value, its uh, biodiversity is all of our human joint responsibility, not only for this generation, but for all generations to come. And this is so we all share this responsibility. So in the next slides, I will talk about what's behind the beauty barrier. So what's behind the enormous beauty that we see. Um, so next slide. For example, I showed you this beautiful image of the dragon blood tree forest. And on the left on the map, you see the actual dot is where uh, this area is, but the dot itself also shows more or less the size of this area. This is the only area where you can see this. Nowhere else on the island does this type of forest still survive. It's disappeared everyone, everywhere else. So if we don't protect this area now, it will be gone in 400, 500. According to mathematical models, it will take maximally 500 years and then they will all be gone. So if we, the change is happening now, but under the skin. This is what you see in the majority of the areas, which is actually dying and breaking and disappearing over mature trees. 
So the dragon blood tree is standing there, it's blooming. Um, there are two dragon blood trees on the right image, and they are, they are having uh, flowers. You can see the, the, um, the light green uh, uh, tufts on the top. But you see nowhere young trees. There are no young trees. Actually, the, old, the trees that you're seeing there are hundreds of years, hundreds years old. So they are centuries old, and they are dying. They are dying from just from age, over maturity, and they have been dying for a long time. But with additional impacts such as climate change, they are now accelerate. The, the extinction is accelerating. So when you go to Socotra, please try to look beyond the beauty of the tree, but look at how much is the proportion of the dead trees to the living trees. And on the right, this is a picture of just a few months ago. I was there in March or April, um, just these dead trees, which I have pictures from before, were not dead yet. And on the left, uh, another tree that just uh, broke. So according to the IUCN most recent conservation outlook assessment for Socotra, Socotra is uh, in the, uh, this um, assessment in, it's going to the, the left side, so the dark side. So it's going to significant concern. Um, and it should go to the right side. What are the concerns? What are the challenges? Uh, as a biologist, I'm looking at ecosystems purely from a challenge to the ecosystem. So I, am, I have no interest in, in what's happening uh, around Socotra as from a biologist, from a scientist point of view, but I'm looking from the ecosystem, what's happening inside the ecosystem and how it's, how it's happening. So the largest effect is the climate change effect. So climate change effects and natural disasters are globally largest, but they are now very clear in Socotra. Second largest, and in combination with the first one, for a longer time, it's now becoming much more evident, and perhaps it's at the same level of climate change, but it's really strong, is unsustainable resource use of land and sea. And then the next one is overgrazing, is actually also a form of unsustainable resource use. But this has been going on for centuries, but is now the effect is very clear. Pollution and rapid development and urbanization is another um, threat, but limited to some areas. And the overall effects are for the whole island are more and more climate change. I'm, I'm conscious that I'm going to my 40 minutes, but if um, with your permission of, permission of the group, I will continue going through the challenges and then give it a sign of hope, if that's okay. It's fine, it's fine, Kay. It's Thank you. Fun. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then challenges with a high negative potential, perhaps not strong yet, but with a high potential of having huge negative effects are invasive species. Uh, and apparent, especially the management of invasive species is very important. The loss of culture, which is linked to the uh, unsustainable resource use and a very high threat, which has led, for example, in the Galapagos for losing its, uh, its World Heritage Site, uh, sorry, for being listed on the danger list, is high impact tourism. And for high impact tourism, we are all potentially, we have a responsibility and we have a, we have a potential to ensure that it does not um, has a, have a high impact by our behavior on the island. For example, by really focusing on biodiversity and not expecting huge luxury on the island. Climate change. This picture is not mine because I, I have not been in satellite, but this is a, one of these huge cyclones. And this is a picture of mine in Home Hill. Uh, for those who've been in Home Hill, it's a na nature sanctuary in the east of Socotra. And this picture is from the first time I was there in 1999. And this is this beautiful uh, Frankenstein tree forest. And you have to know all Frankenstein trees you can see on Socotra are all endemic. So they, they are found nowhere else in the world. In fact, there are 11 species of Frankenstein trees in Socotra is the largest diversity of Frankenstein trees anywhere. Anywhere else, there are just one species here, one species there. But on Socotra, there, it's 40% it's of the diversity of the genes. You see in 1999, and I hadn't seen it when, when I saw the picture, but you see no young trees. So already there was something not right. It looks beautiful and there's evening sun, really nice, which was why I took the picture. But at that time, I didn't see okay, there's no young trees. Why didn't I ask myself that? But there's nothing there. Nothing is growing because the goats are eating everything. Right, so there's already the impact of overgrazing. And that has been there for centuries. And these trees for centuries have been withstanding any 
all the winds and all the monsoons and all the climate effects that were there until then, until 2015. 2015, boom. We have now counted that in this area, between 70 and 80% of the trees are gone. And that this started to decline since the 1960s, gradually, but it declined enormously with enormous drop since the first monsoon, uh, since the first cyclone events, which is purely climate change event in 2015, where two cyclones followed up on each other, Chapala and Meg, very rapidly. And then the second cyclone, Mikunu, which was in 2018, and where we were fast enough to warn people to say, please, uh, it's coming. But the first time, no one was prepared the first time. But the trees were also not prepared. So this is not a random effect, because if this happens again, you lose the rest of these trees. Actually, the tree that you see on the right with the vulture in, after I took this picture and the vulture flew up, this branch collapsed. The tree was really collapsing while I was there. It was quite, quite impressive. So on the left, you see the pictures of exactly the same spot in 1999, 2017. And you see the destruction right after the first series of cycles. On the right, you see a graph of one of our publications. Um, well, not, not mine, but uh, from uh, a group of scientists who've been studying these, these trees for a very long time, and which appeared in a special volume that, that, we, that I was one of the editors for. And you see a gentle decline, which is calculated by satellite imagery since 1956. So this is old RAF photographs, and they were able to really pinpoint every single tree. And so a series of satellite images since then, we're able to count exactly how many trees were present each decade, almost. And you can see a gradual decline until like around 2012, but before 2012, and then when the cyclone comes, you see a sudden drop. And then with mathematical models, if you continue this decline and you do it in two scenarios, the top scenario without cyclones and the below scenario, the little purple line or blue line with, with cyclones, then you see if there's another cyclone event, then in 2036, which I hope I'll still be alive and many of the people who are in this group listening today will still be alive in, in 15 years from now, you will have no tree anymore standing without human intervention and replantation in Home Hill. And you can extrapolate that to most of the island. With, without cyclone events, which is not likely because climate change is going on, then this, this disappearance, this extinction is calculated for 2070. I will no longer be alive, but my children, if I once have children, will witness this. I do not want this to be witnessed. Now that I know this data, I want to do something. I want to change this, which is why I changed from doing pure diversity uh, surveys and doing beautiful pictures on Socotra. I changed entirely into strong conservation efforts in trying to, to anticipate what's going to happen in 30, 70, 100, or 100 years. Another growing impact, and these pictures are from Ahmed Said on the right, and thanks to Ahmed, we, we knew about the species. So we wrote, we wrote a, 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 a paper about this. And Ahmed is co-author on this. Um, invasive species are coming in. This is typical for islands, especially if the trade increases and there's more business going on. This was also one of the reasons that uh, the Galapagos was on the threat. It was invasive species. Invasive species are the number one cause that are proven to be linked to extinction on islands. Rats, cats, for example, killing birds on islands, but also insects that come in like ants. Everybody knows the red fire ant, for example, that's killing uh, animals in islands, different islands in the world. This is one example. In this case, this beetle came in very recently and it's already spreading and it's killing date palms. Now, date palms are not endemic to Socotra, but they're part of the culture and part of the income. So invasive species do not only impact, potentially impact biodiversity, but they can really impact human health and human income. A man can lose its entire date palm um, agriculture field or date palm um, place with one of these invasions. If you don't stop it, 
this is what's going to happen with a mathematical certainty. So invasives are extremely important to stop. And any efforts people do to help palms, it doesn't help if you don't help um, to stop invasives. So this beetle is now there, it's a huge one. Uh, and it was, it's, it actually comes from Southeast Asia and it came in by bringing in palm trees from other countries. Another image I want to show you is because we all imagine beautiful white beaches, but in fact, it's not the case. Much of these areas in Socotra, especially between Habibo and the airport are littered with plastic that doesn't only come from the island itself, but also brought by the ocean. So plastic and especially single use plastics, such as bottles and, and little plastic bags are a huge uh, problem. It's not so much a problem on the terrestrial side, but it can cause huge problem and, and, and pollution, as you know, to marine life. And you, we've all seen the images of, of turtles with, with plastic in their noses, and this is, this is. So when you visit Socotra, please be aware that when you come there, and you've been there before, now it's the rubbish going from the airport to Hadibu, and when you're in Hadibu, it's enormous. When you go to Kalansi, it's less. So there is, there is an issue there of pollution. There's also an issue of disturbance. As the culture is changing a little bit, the young people are also disconnecting a little bit from the local culture and awareness with nature. And this is a recent picture from Detwa Lagoon, which is really a lagoon that is the only Ramsar site in Yemen and designated as such with a global designation for its special bird life and special sea life. So it's now being visited by large groups of young people, and which means it's actually threatening the, uh, bird, the bird diversity and the bird nesting in this area with the noise and the number of people. And because it's a nature sanctuary, it means the young generation is disconnecting from, from the culture that is actually uh, responsible um, with, with these places. Another example is unsustainable wood use, which has always been happening on Socotra, especially in times when fuel was uh, in shortage, but with the monsoons, uh, sorry, with the cyclones, there was much more dead wood. So people were starting to use more, more wood, but it means also less potential for regeneration of plants when there's less um, food going to the soils. So wood is being uh, used. This is a study on the left, a recent study by uh, groups from uh, Sapienza University in Rome and uh, FAO. And I was part of these studies uh, showing density of road network and density of settlements in Socotra. Uh, in the yellow shows the density and the orange, uh, the pink areas and the blue areas show areas that are free of potential human interaction. So you see most of the uh, island is actually accessible by people, which means the mountains are, which means the mountains and all of these areas are quite vulnerable. And on the right, you see a Calancia Lagoon in um, 1999, a picture from Catherine Chung, and below picture of mine 2010, and it's the same now, you see the plastic uh, pollution uh, increase in, in the same lagoon uh, before and after. Then conservation um, efforts. So this is my last section is hope. What can be done? What is, be, what is being done and what, what is done? So there's a whole new generation of Socotra growing up with new things like football, football and, and uh, going to the gym in Socotra and all these new, these new impressions that still live in this environment um, in a modern way. So Socotra has, as I said, this national laws and the international conserva conservation status. And as you know, and as I told you, more than 70% of the land is uh, falling under high status. So there are several efforts ongoing and that have been starting in the last few years of starting to regrow uh, plants, for example, to replant them. This is one of the nurseries in, uh, in Firminin with young dragon blood trees. You have to know dragon blood trees are very, very slow growing. So perhaps in a hundred years they will have fruits. So it means several generations need to take care of these trees. Other examples of replantation is mangroves, which luckily grow much faster. And this is in, in a mangrove site in the north where, where uh, we started to replant mangroves uh, in some area, which is, which are growing really well. Another example is frankincense trees. Uh, they luckily also grow really well. So this is in a school in Dexam where a young, young child is watering 
uh, Frankenstein's tree, and this is a Frankenstein's tree nursery in uh, near Hadibo to replant it. And these are individual efforts. Whenever I'm there, and any tourist can do this, I collect rubbish in every wadi I go. And actually, Ahmed was with me on several of these trips. And where before I would be there on the island uh, looking at dragonflies and, and looking at the animals, now I'm there collecting rubbish and I'm thinking, what am I doing? But really, it makes a difference. So, for example, Ahmed and I, we went to Wadi Danigan and we collected rubbish. And I, I measured the amount of rubbish in each and in some wadis for 100 meters collection. I had more than 40 or 50 kilograms of rubbish. So, and then there are several uh, awareness and education projects. This is a very recent one uh, with um, awareness and education related to freshwater, which was very nice. And then we had larger education and awareness uh, projects on, on Socotra. So in general, creative solutions are possible, but should be sought for increasing climate change resilience, tackling invasive species, and preserving vegetation, which is actually, if you preserve vegetation, you preserve everything that's living with the uh, vegetation. But as also Ahmed pointed out at the beginning, there is a huge problem with uh, this uh, unemployment in Socotra and people are changing, uh, going away from the um, um, taking care of the land. And this is a threat. So solutions exist and have been applied elsewhere in the world, but the main need is also cooperation between all stakeholders but possible. And the governance and the role of local communities are key here to the protection of nature. These are not my pictures, but uh, I just want to show the sea turtles, which are every year again also under threat in Socotra. Then um, for papers and background information, I, I've sent a, a number of uh, papers and documentation to, um, uh, to uh, the, the, natural, the Dubai Natural History Group. So there's also my research case. And then there are some websites that I listed here that you can visit, for example, the website of Friends of Socotra, which has lots of information and leaflets if you wish to visit. But also please have a look at the IUCN Outlook Assessment, which shows you all the ongoing threats, UNESCO files and the World Heritage Recommendations, and then some activities that have been done by UNESCO. And I want to end with this beautiful picture of the girl uh, and the next generation of Socotra, which, is, which will grow up in this area. Thank you very much for your attention and my apologies for running late by 15 minutes. This, I really apologize. Thank you. Thanks so much. That, that was really good. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. K. We have one or two questions. Um, this is from Harry George. He says, can Dr. K tell us what has been the effect of occupying forces on Socotra terrestrial biodiversity since the beginning of the Yemen war? Yes, well, so as I said uh, during my presentation, urbanized changes are very localized. They are mostly uh, localized around the main, the main cities. So for me, from an ecosystem and a biologist point of view, I focus on 99% of the surface and of the place. Um, so if you're talking about changes on land, um, none of these changes, uh, are actually visible inside these very sensitive areas, which are mainly important to preserve most of the biodiversity in, 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 in Socotra. Most of the endemics, for example, they live in the mountains, and then you have also a lot of endemics in lowlands, but from a conservation point of view, this is a, from my side on, uh, in construction, uh, is a minor, uh, minor change to the environment. Although Hadibo is changing, but not only from this, but also from general urbanization and development, which is unstoppable, of course. Because one part of the question was he was thinking of mass construction of bases, landing strips, radars, etc. Well, I don't know how much space a, a landing strip and a radar would take in, but I think on Google Earth, if that would be the case, you would easily see it. And if you go to Google Earth and you see Socotra, you will see that the majority of the island is actually uh, rock <laughs> with trees okay and then the other one the other question i had is is it practically possible to stop invasive um, species well uh, this is has been it has been successfully done in other places in the world and we when we wrote the uh, the paper on the uh, red palm weevil the specialist from kabi uh, 
South African specialist called Dr. Arna Witt. He wrote a whole part about this with examples where it was successfully eradicated. But he said the key to this is cooperation of all stakeholders, which, which means everyone bringing in uh, goods and the local government, but also all other governments that are dealing and, and trading with the place and with the local communities. And only then, and with the right targeted strategy, can you really eradicate uh, uh, certain invasive species. You can also stop them in the start when you know they are coming. For example, the red palm weevil is not the only one that's very dangerous to palms. There's also a, a whole range of other ones. And if you have systems in place to check these plants, for example, when they come in, which is called phytosanitary measures, and when they go out from somewhere else, and you, you follow the law on, on, on these issues, then you can actually stop them from coming. It's more difficult to do it once they're established in the place. But there are invasive species of Socotra that have been there since 100 years ago, like the, the Mexican poppy, for example, which is a yellow uh, thistle-like plant. But others are coming in more recently. And with Ahmed, during the first phase of the UNEP project, we were very strongly working on uh, eradicating, for example, the Opuntia cactus, which you know is terrible in mainland Yemen. But we, Ahmed has been tearing them out of the ground with his own bare hat, with gloves on. Um, so it is possible if you are using the right strategy and you have a, a good management in place to do so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, the ne next one I think is from Alex saying, the dragon tree, what efforts have been taken to preserve the seeds and propagation? What analysis has been done to check the acidity, alkalinity of the soil and the impact of the spore samplings? So to preserve the seeds and propagation, everything is done in situ. So if there's, a, there's conservation in situ and they have been done, there's nurseries that being, are being set up and are there for, for example, these boswellias and several nurseries for the dragon blood trees. But of course, as you say, it's not, or you see the, se the seeds in general, also other species are there. I mean, 37% of all the plants in Socotra are endemic, so it's not only those two trees. Um, but it's a good example of how it's possible to preserve trees and have local nurseries to, to ensure that there's in situ conservation to replant from. There, has, there are analysis of acidity, alkalinity of soil, but actually for people that have been working there for a long time, it's very simple, this um, acidity and alkalinity of soil, because you have either really, and the largest surface, really limestone um, deposits and, and therefore this type of soils that are typical for limestone, uh, weathered limestone, and then there is the uh, the, the um, granite um, type. So you can see those already by geology, and it already has a different vegetation. And so these impacts are are all already studied in advance. And so this knowledge is being used for replantation. Yeah. Okay. And then from Hannah Cam Campbell, and we have a lot of people saying thank you for a wonderful and informative talk. And she said, and what Hannah Campbell is saying is what entities in Socotra, either locally or internationally, are responsible for monitoring or enforcing environmentally friendly practices? Well, this is a simple answer because the, the, the official um, responsible from, for the, uh, for the uh, implementation of the Yemeni uh, national and international um, um, the national laws and the international agreements is the Ministry of Water and Environment and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority. So this is the, the national uh, body responsible for taking care of the environment and of the protected areas. But as I said before, um, because Socotra is an, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is philo philosophically the responsibility of every single individual on earth to take care of this place in our own way, which means with the least impact possible. Um, if you don't mind, I would really still like to also answer the last two questions, if people wish to stay for this. Yeah, they are. I mean, there are some more questions. I will continue with the questions. Yeah. Again, from Alexis, what efforts are being taken to support the communities given the lack of monsoon rains in one plus years, which carries on from what you were saying? How, how can we all help? So I'm not sure whether there is a, a huge lack of monsoon rains in the last one plus years because the going up and down, they have been, I mean, we, we've been looking at climate data for for decades to, 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 I mean, for all the climate data that we have uh, available. So 
Um, so there's there's no extreme droughts now, but there have been extreme droughts recently, and there have been very extreme droughts in, in uh, I think in the 60s and the 70s. But Ahmed will be more will be more uh, will know more about these. There is potentially fluctually uh, a lack of rains, but in fact, what is happening is with climate change that every weather pattern, as you know, is becoming more extreme. So droughts become more extreme and rains become more extreme. So there's saying a lack of monsoon rains is not completely correct because all the rain can, can fall in one or two days. Like we have the data, we saw the data from a few years ago and all the, the average rain of, of the year fell in, fell in just two days in one area, for example. So, um, and efforts that are being taken to support the communities, well, efforts that I've been involved in is actually replanting trees. Trees catch so much moisture in the mountains, for example, these dragon blood trees, that they catch the moisture and bring the water to the soil and planting trees really saves water. So this is one of the efforts to save future water that actually goes into the system. But other efforts, uh, national efforts, very little because as you know, Yemen has at this point, due to the, due to the conflict, very little funds. Um, but sustainable systems for water catchment in Socotra is mainly, for example, um, has been by catching those temporary rainfalls like in, uh, in uh, Karifs, uh, which have been uh, built in Socotra since the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. Okay. There's seven messages. We'll try to see how many we can cover. Yes. Felicita, she says, would the Socotra species stand a chance if they were reintroduced on the mainland? Or would they require disproportionate resources to survive? Well, I this is a an interesting question, but I think first of all, I, I'm not sure what you mean with reintroduced on the mainland. Does that mean the Yemeni mainland? Because if you say reintroduced, it would mean that they come from there, but they don't. They are actually from Socotra. So it would be an introduction to the mainland from a species that's not occurring on the mainland. So I would not advise uh, taking them to the mainland, actually. Um, that's my personal view. I would, and they would not require, uh, on, it's better to put uh, resources to, to, to um, protect them in their natural habitats and to protect the natural habitats on Socotra than it is to move these species outside and protect them there. Of course, to have them in some botanical gardens that then, then perhaps link to conservation efforts that could be could be interesting but as you know that is only the last minute resort if a species is disappearing there are only two trees left then maybe yes you can propagate them outside and then regrow them on the island or reintroduce them but at this point it's more important to to um, protect them on the island itself yeah okay and then there's one it's four minutes past nine i'll carry on till about 9 15 and then i'll call it a halt the one question is, what do the locals use dragon tree blood for? Yeah, many things. You can use it for painting. You can use it for, they, they chew on it for, for stomach. Uh, it has many, many different um, medicinal purposes and it's been proven to have an anti-carcinogenetic, uh, uh, an antibacterial effect. Maybe there's been some phytochemical studies on it. So it actually has a medical, a, a medical force. And, there are even some chemical compounds called cinnabarin, which are only found in the dragon tree. And all the information there is found in, in, the, uh, in the book that I mentioned from uh, Miranda Morris and Tony. Yeah. Then how, um, from Alexis, how can the DNHG community provide support to Socotra conservation efforts from the distance or by visiting to deliver volunteer effort? And thank you, Dr. K, for sharing your knowledge and passion. Uh, that's kind. Actually, I would dare say you, you're always open and free to connect with us being uh, with me and with Ahmed here, who is also in the, in the chat. I will leave my email here uh, because we are all constantly for the last 20 years working in, in conservation and always looking for more ways to do it. But one way you can support is just when you visit is being aware of the vulnerability and the sensitivity of the place, which also translates in your use of plastic in the way you, you, you treat the local people and the local environment with the lowest impact possible. And, and that is really, it, it can also make a change. This is, this is very important. So every individual can do so. 
Okay, and then from Heidi Strokesma is, what impact does climate change and human interference have on the wildlife, such as the cat, civet cat, the chameleon, snakes, etc.? How have they all, how have they fared and suffered, if at all? So the civet cat, first of all, I have to say, is actually a dangerous invasive species that should be, uh, should not be there. It was not, it is not a, a species that should be living there. It was introduced by probably a few centuries ago, but it's, it has huge impact uh, on reptiles and birds, for example. So that's not an animal we wish to uh, preserve, but chameleons and snakes, yes. So the impact of climate change and human interference and how have they suffered. In animals, you can see it will happen slower, visibly slower than it does on vegetation. But if the vegetation is gone, these animals and these birds will be gone. There is no doubt about it. So it can happen in 50 years, can happen in 100 years, but in most islands, these things have happened over a few decades time. So with the decline of vegetation, uh, with use of wood, with stronger urbanization and stronger pollution, they will be gone. So these effects now have not been studied in detail because they have no, not been more recent surveys, for example, reptiles to see declines of the population. But in my survey of dragonflies, there is a, a decline that is very clear. The next one, which species is the most depending on dragon tree forest? Okay. Um, the dragon tree forest, it's, um, to be very honest, there is um, many species depending on this dragon tree forest. And there is even one reptile species that is only endemic, only under dragon blood tree. It does not occur anywhere else on the island except inside dragon blood trees. It's called Hemidac uh, Hemodragon or Hemidacus, Hemodragon, sorry, uh, Dracaina colus, because it's living inside a Dracaena. So there are many, and there are many endemic mollusks, there are many endemic insects that only live in the dragon tree forest. So one of the highest biodiversity and highest endemism on the island is depending on this forest. It's really, really important. Yeah. So what about the invasive species that have economical importance for locals like goats? When um, they were visiting, this is from Sonia Lebrenchik. She says when she was visiting, they were told that goats were one of the main culprits for the lack of young trees. Yes. Well, okay. So originally the Socotri had traditional rules to limit the, the size of population in goats. They were also limiting the areas where there was grazing in certain times of the year, or they would reduce the, the, um, the mating in the mating in the, in the season where they are young, they would actually bind, for example, uh, uh, something in front of the males to, to make sure they wouldn't mate. So they have local traditional systems in place and the ways to, to, uh, to do that is really try and um, either revive or, or, or uh, learn from these traditional ways which come from centuries of knowledge on how to take care of this environment. This is one way. Another way is to, if you cannot stop the goats, because perhaps it's not possible because it's also an economic income, but actually they might, you know, people might also shift uh, from goats to some other incomes. Um, is to protect plants from goats. And for example, within the Boswellia project or the Francis project, we have made special individual tree protections. Each of them cost almost nothing. So a few, a few tens of dollars, you can have one protecting a young tree just by putting it around it and the goats cannot eat this plant. And when the, when the tree is six meters, which is after five or six years for this specific plant, then it's safe. So you can really, there are ways, creative ways to either uh, you, you cannot, you know, you cannot uh, make the goats all disappear uh, magically, but you can protect the area from the goats if you find uh, creative ways. Um, what is my most cherished experience from my 30 years of visiting Socotra? Oof, that is a very difficult question. I, I would say every single visit and every single experience have been, has been cherished. Sometimes it, I mean, my first visit was very impressive, but every visit since then, like for the first time coming into one of these caves, um, visiting the wadis for the first time, I'm more of a freshwater person. So the water areas are very beautiful for me. And um, everything, revisiting friends after many years, for example, seeing Ahmed this year again, after last year and two years ago, 
every single time having tea with the local people or having rice is, is an enormous um, uh, cherished experience. But also this one, talking about this beautiful place is a cherished experience because I can feel, I can feel it right now that I'm there. So I, I always have this feeling. And um, I don't know, whenever I dare, Ahmed will, will tell you I'm, I'm completely at home and happy. So it's really a, a cherished, cherished place. On the other side, seeing some areas that were beautiful before and have very rapidly changed or are full of rubbish also hurts me uh, to my core. And then I want to do something and I want to act. So, or seeing the effect of climate change, I want to act. So the cherished experience, for example, seeing this beautiful forest of Francis's trees has really sparked me to, to really find projects to try and help replant these trees before they're all extinct because I don't want them to go extinct. For, for the local people who actually really use them for income. Yeah, so I really feel connected. I really feel care for the Socotri and for, for the nature, for every single insect and very small animals there. As again, the Socotri will tell you, I, 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 it's, yes, it will not change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for this uh, amazing um, um, attention and these beautiful questions and uh, and I and thank you for this opportunity to um, for me to talk here. I put my email in the in the chat, and uh, you're always free to also have a look at the Friends of Socotra website for information if you want to see uh, some leaflets about birds and animals and plants, uh, anything you wish. It's all freely available there, and also lists of uh, of recent publications that are being done in general in the field. And we also have a Facebook group that you can you can link to. Um, yeah. And um, Gary has said very specifically, thanks to Dr. K for this pre wonderful presentation. And also thanks to Heidi Strakesma for organizing the unforgettable DNHG visit to Socotra in 2010. And then finally, I'm going to hand you over. I, I want to say on a, on a personal note, thank you so much for agreeing to talk. We finally got it together. I know the last year yet you were busy on field trips. So thank you so much for making time to present to our group. And I'm going to now hand you over to Valerie. Thank you very much indeed for such an excellent lecture. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So much to learn. I'm sure every, and everybody else seems to. So thank you very much again, Dr. Kay. Um, just before we go, I just want to say that our next lecture will take place on the 10th of October. Um, and Irini, Metsuski is going to be talking about biomimicry in architecture. The actual title will be given later. But thank you once again. It was an ex excellent evening. Thoroughly enjoyed by all. Uh, again, thank you. I think you can see yourself, Dr. Kate, from all the thanks messages coming through. I, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think the lecture that you have given us has been really well received. I, I just saw from Ahmed uh, from Socotra. I offer my greetings and thanks. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Soko uh, thank you, Ahmed and Socotra, um, and um, and uh, yes, thank you all for your attention. Um, for those who wish to stay a bit longer after this, I will not leave immediately. So after it's finished, I would definitely still wish, wish to say thank you to Gary after this and uh, and uh, to to hang on hang 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 on for a few minutes. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, they seem to be. Gary, are you able to speak or are your speakers still, your audio still not functioning? If I, if I unmute and get very close, I think you can hear me. Yes. We can definitely hear you, Gary. It's very was loud. That, was that too loud? Okay. I, I've, I've had complaints. I have a... Uh, I have a uh, low quality uh, everyday uh, combination camera speaker. It's uh, working it's, very well. It's nice, it's nice to see and hear you uh, again. And as my comment uh, suggested, uh, my own experience visiting uh, Socotra for uh, a long uh, week with the uh, Dubai Natural History Group, uh, now more than 10 years ago, was unforgettable uh, and uh, uh, but of course we didn't learn everything then it's the the for your photos and all brought things back for 
for me, as I'm sure they did for everybody else that was on that uh, that trip. Thank, thank you very much, Gary. It's nice seeing you again. Last time I saw you, it was 2004 in Sharjah at the meeting, one of the meetings of uh, Paul and David. So it's been a long time, but I remember you had glasses back then. I can't remember. I think so. Yeah, I don't. I don't need to, at, at this distance. I don't need the glasses. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, it's nice seeing you're, you. You're seeing me actually from, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in New York, uh, okay. where I was uh, uh, trapped as a caregiver and by COVID, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm still sorting the rest of that out. I hope to be back, uh, for, for everybody listening, I hope to be back uh, with you all in Dubai uh, within a couple of months, but there keep being little complications. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope everyone else is also staying healthy and, and, and with COVID. It's been a very challenging year uh, for everyone, which is why these kind of uh, presentations are extremely nice to connect uh, when, when sometimes we, we have not been able to travel or we cannot travel. So this is a very nice opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we can wrap up. I don't know if the... If there's any I have one question. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty curious now to learn more about Socotera because today's talk was a little bit more focused on how endangered everything is. But I would love to learn more about the ecosystems of Socotera. And if not the Dubai group, we would invite you from Abu Dhabi, but we can check with Valerie for next year, maybe, if you have time. I would really love to learn more about the different, I have no idea of Socotera, I must admit, so I would love to learn more. Okay, I, I don't mind doing this, and I pass through Dubai or Abu Dhabi quite often, so at least three or four times per year I am actually there, so there might be opportunities. Um, for the rest, I can when it's about really technically about ecosystems and about the biodiversity itself, I can also definitely refer to our books and publications. And one of these books is the, the book called The Natural History of Socotra and Its People, which is a book we worked on for several years, which has very detailed information. And then now recently I've made a new book, which will appear in October, which has really also a general overview of the, of the uh, so there is uh, quite a lot of literature as well, but I will be happy, of course, to either in person or online, talk about this again and talk about more, because my background is as a scientist is pure biology and, and biodiversity. So I can talk about more about these things with, with pleasure. Yeah. This would be great. Yeah, you're welcome. But I wanted to focus on, on um, challenges because many people are not aware of these things and this is, Quite, re quite recent uh, technical publications are appearing about this, which really shows the evidence. And I want to introduce people also this so that when you go, you also have a responsible view of the place. Not, it's again, the Marilyn Monroe effect. <laughs> like not seeing her as a beautiful woman, but somebody with the whole package that everything is, you know, this, not, not to just um, only look at the outside, but also at the inside. Yeah. Because we're all, I remember Gary, for example, is very, has been very, um, interested in mollusks, collecting mollusks all over Arabia, which have led to many publications but on Socotra. There are really, really several mollusks that are facing extinction because they're very small area of endemism. So if you build on that area, just the species is gone. And uh, this Socotra is extremely sensitive for these things. So um, that's what I wanted to also show. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. I don't know you, but thank you for your remark. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I will, I will send you a message and discuss it with Val, who will invite you for next year of us. Yes, anytime. Thank you very much. Anybody else, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay. So again, thank you so much. I'll bring it to an end. And again, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And we'll discuss further by email about the publications. You can discuss it with Gary and Valerie because that's sort of, um, you know, what you've sent me, that really, that lies in the responsibility for Gary and Valerie to manage. Yes, no, no worries. Okay, we can, we can, that's not a problem. Okay.
Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, if you need anything or you wish to know anything, just uh, just let me know. I'll be here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good evening. Please be safe, all of you. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. Shukran. Shukran. Good night, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.